Here we are, finally, I'm talking to Dr. Michael Greger of Nutrition Facts. So excited to finally meet you. <laughs> so we have a trillion questions that we could ask the master of Nutrition Facts, but you know, we're not gonna be able to ask all the questions we would ever dream of asking. So um, first of all, I just wanna give a major, major thank you to just all the work that you've done over the years and and just sort of all of the obviously sacrifices and time and so forth that you made to get all of that content out and just keep it going. Just let's just start with the goofy ones. Someone says, when are you bringing back the beard? And I see that you're already bringing back the beard. So this is like an early release. Don't, I did it for them. Did it for them. Yeah. <laughs> See, this is what happens when you pressure people. Psychic powers. That's one of the, uh, you know, you, people don't think about that with plant-based diets, but that's one of the barks. When is that video coming? I want to see the research. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. You should know by now. <laughs> All right. So we have a bunch of sort of just general nutrition questions that I want to might as well hit you with first. And some of them have to do with it. You know, you're obviously into the whole foods thing. I'm into the whole foods thing. And uh, people are always wondering, they're always asking me like, how much oil can you get away with without an issue? Or what's the best oil? If I have to put douse a little bit in a pan, what's the oil? You know, they're always, so what's your answer there? Someone put a gun to my head and forced me to, <laughs> yeah, I know. This is so funny. Um, oh yeah, no, I mean, there's, there's certainly uh, less healthy oils than uh, more healthy oils. Yeah, certainly it's uh, all about quantity. If you had to do an oil, some unrefined oil like extra virgin olive would probably be best. Um, uh, and normally I'd say, but better to eat the whole food. Although the problem with olives is, uh, because they're brined in salt, then you have a sodium issue with the whole food. So, but certainly instead of walnut oil, you can eat the walnuts yourself and then get the fiber and all the non, um, uh, fat soluble, uh, nutrients. Yep. Um, the whole foods always a better way to go. But, um, you know, one of the problems with the refined oils, like something that just says vegetable oils, typically a soybean oil. Um, is uh, the process by which you actually refine. Like when you make corn oil, you think corn. It's like, wait a second, I can see walnut oil, mm -hmm. but wh where's, like the oil? where's the fat, fat in yeah. corn? There ain't a lot yeah. of it. So uh, you, you do these kind of harsh chemical treatments that can actually create a few percent of trans fats. Mm -hmm. So normally we think of trans fats only in partially hydrogenated oils, um, but actually in refined oils, like say, you know, canola, canola yeah, yeah. and things. You actually get a little, now, it's a teeny bit if you're just using a little bit, but you know, really the ideal intake of trans fats is probably zero. Um, and so, yeah, I mean, you know, but, uh, you know, but look, if without the extra virgin olive oil, you would not eat your broccoli, mm -hmm. then put it on your broccoli, oh, right? I mean, okay. it's, it's, I mean, it, it, uh, it, so um, uh, extra virgin olive oil broccoli is better no than. Broccoli. Uh, uh, vegan donut. Yeah, then, yeah. then a vegan donut. Okay, there. That's yeah, that's understandable. Then what about the omega sixes though? Don't, wouldn't there maybe be a oil that's higher in omega threes? You know, if you've oh yeah, so yeah, so uh, omega six which oils are really uh, crappy processed oils. Is a safflower oil, yeah. safflower, sunflower. Um, uh, what's the other corn oil? Um, and then there's a fourth really high. A safflower, sunflower. I mean, I was under the impression corn. that olive had a decent amount, where you know, at least that um, ratio. Well, no. So, uh, so uh, canola is better in terms of uh, make the ratio, uh, but some are just really high. Yeah, some are really high. But again, if you're just using a little bit and you're eating lots of flax seeds and yeah. walnuts, and you know, it doesn't really. So, what what yeah. do you think about then, like flax oil or, or something like that, or is that? Oh. Yeah. Well, no, I mean, so flax oil, I mean, so, you know, the omega-3s are so sensitive. They get rancid. That, I mean, that's why you have to put, you know, flaxseed oil in the fridge. It goes rancid, mm -hmm. et cetera. Whereas, and this is really remarkable, you can take milled flaxseeds, ground flaxseeds with the, you know, breaking out, you know, that nice hard natural hole, opening it up on the, on, at room temperature for six months in an airtight container, and there's no detriment and, you know, uh, you know, ALA doesn't go rancid. I mean, it's really remarkable that in the whole food form, even when it's ground up, exposed, I mean, still retains um, its nutrition, doesn't go rancid. Whereas the oil, a couple days, you know, can, I mean, you just couldn't do that. I wonder if there's some just like thing you could add. Maybe there's a chemical in that ground flax that's preventing it from oxidizing or whatever's happening, going rancid. Well, yeah, you yeah, add so it to the oil. Presumably, uh, presumably it's the antioxidants, yeah. right? I mean, if we worry about oxidation. Uh, you know, it's just packed with antioxidants. Um, and so, in fact, that's what preservatives are, like BHA, BHT, mm -hmm. you know, these these artificial preservatives, they're antioxidants, they're artificial antioxidants, they're antioxidant chemicals that just mop up free radicals. 
Um, but, so we should just be taking baths in these chemicals every morning when we wake up. Just jump into the tub filled with that. So, uh, yeah. <laughs> Antioxidant bath. Nice. Well, let's move on a little bit. Here's an interesting one. I have mentioned this on my channel a few times, and you've had videos hinting at this, that the idea that leucine can, you know, increase IGF-1, mTOR, so forth. And I have, I think it was Raphael Pinto here asking... Uh, would that in plant-based form have a problem, like a protein powder with leucine? Do we have the same issue there? So, yeah, that's what uh, yeah you'd have the same issue. So uh, that's why, I mean, it's a high enough uh, soy so protein it, yeah. consumption, for example. Um, you can get a, a bump in IGF-1. I mean, the study's been done. Yeah, the three to five. You know, I mean, it's it's there's nothing magical. I mean, the reason that your body can tell the difference between plant protein, typical plant proteins, typical animal proteins, is the amino acid profile. Mm -hmm. Um, and uh, there's some so-called high-quality proteins, high-quality prime proteins, uh, meaning kind of similar in ratio to your own human proteins, um, that cause that same kind of uh, you know anabolic kind of reaction, and uh, soy is one of them. So actually, ironically, the benefits of eating quote-unquote low-quality pl proteins, um, maybe in terms of longevity, mm -hmm. in terms of the methionine, leucine. I have some videos coming up on branched-chain amino acids oh, nice. and their detrimental effects on... Uh, Glucose homeostasis, etc. Interesting, yeah, because I, I made a video about how BCAAs are kind of have that potential nice. dangerous, and that you know you get over that three to five is like four grams of leucine that could be an issue, but I was very nice. speculative, so I wasn't sure. All right, let's move so. on to one talking about some animal products a little bit. Um, I actually made a video talking about what you said, where the dairy leaching the calcium from the bones because it's acidic oh, yeah. was a myth, and then someone came right to me and was like, hey, the author of this of this study is actually a speaker for the dairy industry, is very pro-dairy, and so what are your thoughts on that? Oh yeah, look, just because someone has financial conflict of interest doesn't mean that what they're saying is wrong. Yeah. So right, when someone uh, you know, works for the nut industry, comes out with a nuts are good study, yeah, you look at it with a little like, oh, well, maybe, you know, they're, you know, they uh, they created the study in a way to give a false pro, or maybe they shelved studies that didn't have the right, uh, you know, uh, things they wanted, but it's also possible nuts are really good for you, yep, yep, yep. right? Um, and so, um, so that does not disqualify a study. A study that is funded by the egg industry doesn't disqualify the study. All it does is you just have to look a little harder. You just have to, you know, you gotta dig through the materials and methods. You really gotta understand exactly how the study was put together. Um, so you don't just throw out baby bath water, you say, but you do look at it a little more than you would if it was some, uh, you know, independent team of scientists. Yeah. Um, where, where then you just kind of assume they did it right, mm -hmm. and so you can just kind of dig into the results. But then, you know, but anytime, you know, uh, egg industry or the nut industry or the raisin industry or the watermelon anytime there's any kind of funding study you just got to make sure that uh, they didn't go with this kind of you know these kind of preconceived notions and basically set up the study to uh to to get a desired result for their yep, corporate yep, master yep. so it's, it's more of a red flag and then so my my uh, logical sort of response was like the theory of the acid leaching is probably wrong, especially because we're talking about protein acidity. Then you have to say even taking like a plant-based protein powder would suck suck all the calcium out of your bones. Um, so that's interesting. But then I was thinking maybe it's if there is a so. Okay, so my question would be if you think there if there is an association that's real, is it just an association between dairy product consumption and hip fractures? Could it be saturated fat? Is there a potential causality or not? What are your thoughts? Oh, oh well, no. I mean the whole acid thing. Uh, it wasn't just theory. It, you could do that. You it was, it was uh, reproducible easily in anybody's lab, and it was done in multiple labs where you give people a steak and all, and you measure the calcium in their urine. Simplest thing yeah. in the world, and and your calcium just dumps out in your urine when you eat a steak. Yeah. Um. And so I mean, so this wasn't like some crazy vegan theory. This was the mm. mainstream nutrition science theory that oh, that's what happens has this acidifying effect, your, your body has to, you know, uh, basically leach calcium um, to, to, uh, to, to, to kind of, uh, you know, to buffer the acidifying effects of these animal proteins. Mm -hmm. And where are you going to get calcium from? Well, obviously, most of it's stored in your skeleton, so obviously that we're leaching it out of the skeleton. And hey, that's why, maybe that's why there's so many hip fractures in Sweden and you know, all these places where they have um, a high, uh, you know, dairy product consumption, like it really fit together nice. Yeah. Like this was not some, um, but then we find out, oh, that's the source of the calcium actually isn't from your bones, mm. it's actually from the, oh, oh, that's interesting. Oh, okay. So that theory out the yeah. window, we still have to explain 
the the uh, you know epidemiological evidence suggesting higher hip fracture rates um, in dairy drink countries, and you know it could be. You know, I mean, my first thought, you know, when I saw that data, it was like, well, duh, of course people are breaking their hips more in Sweden than in China right. because there's ice. Oh, there's ice. Like, yeah, there's, there you go. There's like, <laughs> they're like, I mean, we're talking Sweden. Yeah. Who, how many people are slipping on the ice in, you know, in, in sub-Saharan mm -hmm. Africa, mm -hmm. right? Another thing was the, the hips uh, in, in, in Asia are geometrically yeah. different. Then and 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 uh, maybe less prone to fracture and so but then you look at their spine and you can say well, oh my god you can be riddled with uh, osteoporosis even though you don't have hip fracture rates all sorts of things um, so but anyway so um, but the most interesting data was this galactose thing mm -hmm. right I mean was this you know this these Swedish researchers tried to get you know so what a hundred thousand people followed for a few years and found that you know women who drank the most milk had most fractures higher death rates higher cancer rates all sorts of things thinking maybe it's the galactose. You know, lactose breaks down into this galactose stuff um, and at really high levels has all sorts of negative effects on the bone and, and these other things. Um, but maybe even at these these lower levels. Again, it's a, and why do they think this dairy? Well, because these fermented dairy products yeah. where the galactose wasn't there, didn't have the same associations. Again, we don't know exactly what's going on. It's fascinating stuff. Yeah. Uh, but that original calcium acid theory as beautiful and wrapped up as it looked at the time, there's new data. I mean, there's new data. Anyone who's interested in science, interested in evidence, interested in truth, evidence in data, evidence interested in the real world, well, then you just change. I mean, you know, uh, you know, the, 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 the evidence doesn't fit your preconceptions. The preconceptions fit the, I mean, you know, you, you, you know, that's why we do research. Otherwise, why don't we just you know, uh, you know, look at chicken and for sure. <laughs> for sure. Um, and, but then I would say, you know, assuming, okay, so that's wrong. Is there any possibility though, that in the same way that we have that sort of black, lower back artery clogging disc degeneration, could there be any, maybe can I, especially if someone really gets advanced aging that their hips could just get less nutrients and from, from the clogged arteries from saturated fat and dairy is of course the main source. Of oh, well, fat. Oh, 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 I, I see interesting, right. Like the vertebral arteries with the, with the, 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 the disc degeneration. Um, oh, that's interesting. Because that was my um, first thought, was like, well, I mean, if kids oh, are able to get it there, yeah, it's avascular tissue right. versus like actual bone tissue, but over into late age and, and over time clogging more and more. Anyway, we don't know that either way, so. So, I mean, so, but I mean, you, I mean, you could do, I mean, you could see if, you know, high, you know, LDL is correlated with high fracture yeah. risk. I mean, the, I mean, and if it didn't, then. I mean, if it did, wouldn't necessarily mean it's yeah, right. But if it didn't, then it would really kind of throw some cold water on through. Okay, cool. And then, so, okay, let's move on totally. Uh, someone was asking, why not have a, like, Dr. Gregor Nutrition Facts Clinic? You've probably been asked this all the time, why you can't just go see Dr. Dr. Gregor as a, a doctor or whatever. So if you have, you probably have a quick answer. You've said that a thousand times. The, well, I mean, the reason is because Dr. Gregor is treating patients a million at a time. There you go. You heard it from the I, man's mouth. <laughs> I mean, I mean, I just, right. I mean, uh, I mean, yeah, I gave up clinical practice because no matter how little time I gave everybody, mm -hmm. how many people can you see in a yeah. day? Um, and so, you know, that's why, so right. So YouTube, we just hit a hundred million, a uh, hundred million video views yes. last week. Right. I mean, that's like, I missed that one-on-one. -on -one. Yeah. Um, but you know, when I take a step back and try to think of it logically, I'm like, mm -hmm. I just can't justify taking that kind of you know, one on one time. Although I do get some of that when I, you know, go around and speak. So uh, my next speaking tour, new books coming out in December. All right, new um, book. Uh, new book. It looks like we have about 250 cities potentially lined up. Jeez. Um, and then I get that one on one time. You know, the book signing lines and can hang out with people, and that's. And that's a nice break from just sitting in front of a screen for years on end. Would you consider but, uh, starting a clinic where you weren't necessarily on the ground, but like Dr. Greg, kind of like Barnard, like Dr. Gregor's clinic oh, for yeah, the yeah. doctors no, no. under you? Well, yeah. No, I, I tell people to go to the Barnard okay, Medical yeah, Center. Yeah. Fantastic. PCRM, uh, Friendship Heights, D.C. area. Um, uh, uh, there are similar kind of plant-based clinics, lifestyle medicine clinics popping up all over the place. Mm -hmm. um, so uh, there's a website, plantbaseddocs.com, yeah, sure I believe. Um, uh, McDougall has a list of kind of plant friendly doctors. Plantrition Project has a list of, of you know, evidence based nutrition kind of practitioners. Yeah, but uh, but uh, yeah, uh, no clinic anytime soon. Yeah. But uh, hopefully, I, we will we will so change the medical profession 
that uh, every clinic will be a Dr. Mm-hmm. Greger clinic. Nice. That's, that's, you heard it. There you go. Um, and that really probably would be your answer to the question I had later on of, uh, let's say, you're eating a, a vegan diet or whatever, and you're having some type of issue, and your local doctor just has no understanding of what's going on and, and, right. and, and says you need animal protein or just something off base like that. That would be your suggestion to kind of travel to the nearest doctor? Is there anything else? Oh, well, I mean, first of all, listen to the doctor. I mean, the doctor, so, um, uh, you know, first of all, it really may, so may, it may have nothing to do with your diet at all, right? Mm-hmm. Um, I mean, you see, people still get sick, regardless of how healthy they mm-hmm. eat. You still get by bus. There's all sorts of things that can go wrong. Um, and, uh, and maybe it is something to do with your diet. Yeah. And even I if mean, your doctor you know, says, so your doctor says, eat fish and eggs, for example, and we're going to talk, talk about the ex vegan thing later. Oh, so. oh, well, I mean, then, well, no, then, I mean, that's like going to a mechanic who says, uh, you know, pour water in your gas tank. Mm-hmm. Well, what do you do when you go to a mechanic like that? You get a new mechanic. Like, that's just ridiculous, mm-hmm. right? No, absolutely. I mean, but, uh, I mean, I, I see the, uh, the, uh, I, mean, I think it's a natural tendency to want to go see, you know, plant-based practitioner because they're not clueless. At the same time, if everybody, if all the healthy people go to see plant-based practitioners, we're not going to be able to educate mm-hmm. the mainstream doctors. So when you walk in the door and you're, you know, middle-aged on no meds, cholesterol is beautiful, you know, and, and you know, your hot, blood pressure is beautiful and you just, I mean, you are a shining beacon and you talk about your diet and they're like, wow, I've got you know, 10,000 patients your age, and none of them are doing as good as you, you know, then when the next person comes in and says, I'm thinking about a vegan diet, they're not going to just look at them crazy because they just had someone walk in, you know, I don't know. I mean, it's sad that it takes that kind of anecdotal, you know, evidence yeah. to get people, but you know, that's how, mm-hmm. unfortunately, the human mind works. And uh, it's not the mountain of evidence. It's often these one or two little anecdotes to get people to kind of change the way they think about these kind of things. And I will, I, I probably don't follow this as much, but we've had a few influencers, social media influencers, YouTubers, Instagrammers, so forth, have some type of health issue, whether it was SIBO or something else. And for example, one of their doctors did say, eat fish and eggs, and they did it. And so <clears throat> I just want to ask you a few questions about this. So we have had these people kind of going, uh, you know, even you know, making like get healthy with me videos where they go, you know, they quit vegan and, and, and you know, they're eating eggs all the time. And, and so... What is your sort of view on that? And and do that there are people vegans who think and or probably really obviously do have actual issues. And so, how do you think they should address those? Like, for example, you have bad SIBO. What should you do on a vegan diet? Yeah. So um, no. So uh, it, uh, first of all, it's important to uh, not minimize people's you know medical issues, medical problems. People can get sick on any kind of diet, um, and diet may very well be playing a role. Mm-hmm. Um, uh, so, uh, you know, so, I mean, that's, that's kind of the first thing. And, uh, you know, there's things that can go, you know, you want to make sure they're getting the B12. You want to make sure they're, uh, I mean, you know, uh, they're getting enough calories. I mean, some people are kind of the most common complaint, uh, you know, I used to hear, um, in clinical practice, people come back, they have no energy. I'm like, and we do like a little calorie count. They're eating like starvation level diets. I'm like, what is going on? And they're like, what do you mean? I'm eating so much food. But no, you're eating the same amount of food they used to mm-hmm. eat. So they look down at a plate. They say, this means supper. Yeah. This much food on my plate looks supper. You can't eat just this much food um, eating a whole food plant-based diet because it's so calorie mm-hmm. dilute mm-hmm. that you just not get enough calories. And so you're just like, wait a second. You're eating 800 calories? 800 calories? That's what they gave people in Dachau, 800 calories. Well, you, of course you have no energy. Yeah. You're not <laughs> okay. eating. Yeah. Um, so... Um, so, and so then you just got to eat more, right. you know, it's, it's some really energy dense, you know, trail mix kind of things, you know, avocados, nuts, whatever to get your calorie counts up. Oh, and then all of a sudden they feel better. Right. But I mean, these simple things that, you know, people may not understand. Yeah. Um, and so there's some tweaks we can make. Uh, and I will say that's what's happening in, in like 90% of the cases with people. I'm talking like there's a few long-term vegans, you know, vegan four to seven years or whatever who have gone. I've had the SIBO, you know, I eat this fiber and I get this reaction. I bloat and I get cramping or whatever. Oh, and so, oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. So, yeah. So, I mean, it's a microbiome. Yeah. I mean, obviously, so obviously there's been some, some uh, you know, a disruption, some kind of uh, dysbiosis in the microbiome. Um, and so, you know, that's like these FODMAP kind of diet things, right? But even the FODMAP, even the people that invented the whole FODMAP diet say you should only do it for a couple of weeks because it's so unhealthy. Mm. I mean, uh, I mean, absolutely. 
Um, but, um, you know, be, I mean, in fact, these are, uh, you know, uh, the, some of these fructooligosaccharides actually feed our good bacteria. So we don't want to take them out of our mm -hmm. diet. But if you have this slew of bad bacteria that are, that are uh, you know, causing bloating instead, then, you know, there, you know, there's temporary things we can do. Um, I mean, and so that's why it may make, in a, you know, many months for some people to, to eventually be able to take the kind of fiber load just because they've, uh, you know, their whole, they've been slathering their intestines with, you know, uh, cheeseburgers and milkshakes their whole lives, never had a dose of fiber in their life. And all of a sudden they're asking their bugs to do some, some major lifting. It can take some time. Um, for that adaptation, you know, people eating beans, most people it's fine, but other people got to go really slow. Otherwise, their you know, microbiome just can't deal with it at this point. And so all, there could be all sorts of insults. It could be an antibiotic thing. Another one is fasting. A lot of people have done long-term fasting or even colonics where they're like pressurizing air going and they're like bringing that lower, lower bacteria into the upper. Bacteria. And so, I mean, so if they are, right, so if there's any kind of insult for whatever reason, um, then... Um, you know, uh, anything that feeds, so if you have some bad bugs down there, feeding those bad bugs, um, and many of the bad bugs eat the same thing the good bugs eat, you can get these, mm -hmm. you know, bad reactions when they kind of outnumber the good, um, the, the good ones. Um, and so it's a matter of, um, you know, you can do elimination diets to see what's, uh, what's causing it. You can, um, uh, you know, I mean, you can do, there's, just kind of firebombing approaches where you take these broad spectrum antibiotics to basically kind of reset people's mm -hmm. gut floor, and then do um, mm -hmm. probiotics. I mean, basically, you go to a good gastroenterologist and you, you know, figure out how to how to deal with it. But um, the answer is not eat unhealthy. Eat a diet that's gonna yeah. kill you from heart disease. Uh, you know, I mean, I mean, eating unhealthy is like it's just like never. It's just like okay, how many things benefit from smoking, right? I, I mean, so who said you know smoke cigarettes and it'll be better? There actually are surprisingly mm -hmm. a few things. Parkinson's disease, decreased risk of Parkinson's disease. Ulcerative colitis gets better when you smoke. Ulcerative colitis, huh. very painful inflammatory nice. bowel disease. Ulcerated bloody stool gets better when you smoke. Why? Because smoking hurts your immune system. And your mm. immune it's an autoimmune disease. And so it actually quiets down. It's an immune suppressant. And so, but are we going to tell somebody to smoke? It'll make your gut feel better. <laughs> yeah, but yeah. then you die <laughs> drowning of lung cancer. Okay. Uh, that's, that's a great analogy. That's not the answer. Yep. The answer mm. is to how can we do a life-sustaining diet and figure out what's going on with the underlying disease. Cool. All right. We're getting, we're like maybe three quarters of the way through. Um, oh, another one. Interesting. So we've had a lot of people that have also gone on really yeah, high. eight yeah. minutes. Okay, cool. We've had a lot of people that have gone on like extreme fruity diets. And so the question would be, where is the threshold where you're crossing over from like that good amount of fruit to the too much fruit? Do you know if there is one? What are your thoughts? So, I mean, I have that video where they-, they How much fruit exactly is too much fruit? Yeah. Yeah, right, right. Where they literally, I think it was Jenkins up at University of Toronto. They're like, let's give it a try. Mm -hmm. Come on. There has to be some level. So they gave, I believe it was 23 servings of fruit a day. Yeah. It was like the fructose found in like two liters of Coke or something, right? It's like, okay, at that level, certainly we'd start to see the negative effects of fructose, like increased liver fat, blood pressure, abdominal fat, etc. No. Oh, there you go. In fact, they saw, if anything, they saw benefits. Mm. Now, are you going to say, oh, yeah, but if they would have had 24 servings of fruit, yeah. then they would have just collapsed mm. in rubble, right? No. Oh, maybe. We don't have data. I, but yeah. okay. Yeah, we have data up to 23 servings a day. I think that's, you know. Okay, because I, I mean, from my personal experience, I didn't do well in fruit and I did a, I took my uh, fasting or my glucose, not fasting. And uh, I was fine with every starch-based meal, every, even going to restaurants. And then I ate five bananas quickly and I went well over 200 and, and the glucose was too high. So, I mean, it, maybe there's different effects and we probably need more data, but uh, I was, anyway. That's my view. I don't know if you have a comment on that. Well, I mean, the, the concern is, I mean, that's what's supposed to happen when you eat uh, carbohydrates is it goes into your bloodstream and then it gets partitioned mm -hmm. to your body, right? It's the it's primary fuel for your brain, for your muscles, for everything. And so it, it can't magically transport from your intestines into your muscles without going through the bloodstream. So obviously your blood sugar goes up. The problem is when it goes up so high mm -hmm. so quickly that you get such an insulin surge that actually drives your sugars too low. You're right, and so you get that. And I had that. I actually had that. Oh, I went and so way, you had yeah. to, Okay, right. Okay, so, um, so what that's saying is we were net, just not meant to eat yeah. four bananas back to back. And why? Because bananas, if you look back a few thousand years before they were domesticated, were you know these hard, teeny, big seeds, blah blah blah. There's no way, right? 
you can see the fruits and vegetables like, you know, our fellow great apes eat. They're chewing forever because mm -hmm. they're these mat, these fiber. They're trying to squeeze every last little juice of the, these really fibrous kind of fruits. Um, but we, right, domesticated them just to, to make them as, you know, appealing as possible, um, understandable. So, uh, but, yeah, and, yeah, so. Uh, so it could be, yeah, we don't know. We need more data. Yeah, I mean, oranges, basically orange juice. Okay, oh, here's one that I think is interesting to talk about a lot. So they had a, a recent, you know, not huge study, pretty recent out of Switzerland of the mac micronutrient status of vegans, maybe you're familiar with it. And they found out there was no statistically different, different deficiency rate for the B12, which is great. And maybe if they had more, they would have found a little one. But it was the same, more or less. But then they found that zinc, the vegans weren't doing that well in zinc. And so what are your what are your recommendations for really nailing that zinc on a, especially whole food? So the, the problem, right? So the problem is that you cannot, there's no, there is no test for zinc status. Mm. So serum zinc levels, which is probably what they do, is not a good indicator of what your zinc stores are. Mm -hmm. um, just like, you know, a serum ferritin, I mean, just like serum iron levels doesn't necessarily help what your iron stores are. Um, and so, but so, so unfortunately, but that's, that's, that makes things difficult because then how do you know you're deficient? Um, you know, you're deficient when you start losing your taste, your sense mm -hmm. of taste, um, when you, uh, you get more colds and things because your immune is su immunity is suffering that we don't want to get to that yeah. level. Right. And so basically you can't test for what your zinc status is. So what do you do? You just make sure you get enough zinc. Yeah. How do you do that? You eat your, you know, you eat your legumes, mm -hmm. you eat your beans, split peas, chickpeas, um, uh, lentils, so pumpkin seeds. Uh, pumpkin seeds, right, right, um, right, and so we just make sure we get zinc-rich sources in our diet, and then we don't worry about it. Cool. Okay, so again, we have that those influencers jumping off the wagon, and, and kind of people just follow them, sort of. I don't want to say completely blindly, but they're I want they I want to do what they do, so they quit too. And so, what would be your biggest piece of advice for sort of staying vegan long term, whether it's a social thing or a nutritional thing? Oh what do you think? well, I mean, the studies suggest that it's social pressures, and the number one reason for so-called veg recidivism is not that people don't feel good; it's just that it's so difficult in our society to you know holidays and social gatherings, and it's just business meetings, whatever. Um, it's just difficult to fit it into one's life. Obviously, that'll get easier as, as, as a greater percentage of the population shifts that way. It'll be more convenient, et cetera. Um, you know, we may, I don't know uh, how long you've been doing, I mean, but, you know, soy milk used to be brown and chunky and little aseptic containers at these, at these <laughs> health food stores, right? I mean, and now it's in the dairy case. Like, it's just so much easier, but it'll get easier still. Um, and so if it's the social pressures, then you need to surround yourself with like-minded folks. And so there's social media groups and that's sort of, I mean, there's, even if you live in the middle of Kansas or whatever, and you just don't have any, you don't have a neighbor, um, but you know, there's ways you can connect with people and support each other. And that's why, you know, uh, you know, your channel, these kind of things can be so helpful for people. Um, uh, but in terms of like nutritionally, the most important thing, well, I mean, one of the important things is we got to get rid of this guru worship crap, right? Um, I mean, mm -hmm. uh, something is not good or bad because someone said it so. Um, it's something's good or bad because there's evidence, there's data that says, or there's no data and we just don't know. And the answer is we have no idea. Um, and then when you do that, then you can make, you know, and it's because we're making life and death decisions, right? If you're buying a new toaster or then fine, listen to what mm -hmm. some random person on a website says about that toaster, right? Okay, mm -hmm. I mean, you know, but, um, but you know, listening to what some random person at the gym says about diet, the number one cause of death and disability in the United States, the American diet, I mean, it's like the most important decision we make for our health, and you're gonna let just some, like, Checkout store magazine tell you what to feed the family. <laughs> yeah. I mean, that's unbelievable to me, right? Mm -hmm. um, so, if there's any decision in the in our life that should be based on evidence, it should be, you know, um, you know what you what we should eat and feed our, ourselves and our families. Um, and so, I encourage people to seek out evidence, primary sources. You just need to to and so. It's don't listen to what I say, listen to what the science says. And so I, that's why nutrition facts, I just present the science and then I can say, well, you know, this is what, this is how my family has changed their diet based on this. But you can look at the same signs and be like, what? 30% increased risk in colorectal cancer. I'm going to still eat my hot dogs. You know, mm -hmm. yes, that's the same bump in risk you get uh, in lung cancer, living with a smoker as a spouse mm -hmm. of a smoker and getting all that secondhand smoke, increase your risk of lung cancer by about the same amount. And you can be like, oh, it doesn't bother me at all. Yeah. Fine, <laughs> hot dogs, right? I mean, but 
um, I look at that same data and say, I'm not going to eat a hot dog because I don't want to die of colorectal cancer. Yeah, and you wouldn't want your kid to live with a smoker, and so you wouldn't want to feed your kid sausages, what? what you do anyway. Right. <laughs> yeah, no, that's that's a, that's a very good yeah. parallel, right? I mean, would you want your kid around that all the time? Yeah. No, because it's not healthy for them. Then why are you giving them Lunchables with processed meat? Great. I, I think we have to wrap up, but I want to just ask one really quick one. What do you? Because because you know, science has limitations of what's happened already, what we've researched. So, would there be any cool things that you would like to see, or that you would kind of predict studies coming out about, or really, you're excited for, you know, you know, in terms of research in the near future? Oh, well, um, you know, the two big uh, revolutions have, uh, in terms of our understanding of the power of lifestyle medicine, has been the microbiome um, and epigenetics. Um, uh, and, uh, you know, something that I've been really interested in, just because I've been getting deep into it with this uh, new book, is chronobiology. Mm. The impact of kind of our circadian rhythms on everything from drug side effects to lifestyle to, I mean, so like um, if you look at uh, suicides, for example, if you drink the same amount of poison in the morning, mm. you're, you know, I forget, twice as more, twice, uh, half as likely to die than the exact same amount of poison in the evening because mm. you're just, your body is able to metabolize it. Um, eat the same number of calories in the morning less fattening than eating the same number of calories in the evening, lower, less blood sugar spikes, less triglycerides, all sorts of really fascinating stuff. So it's not just what you eat and how much you eat, but when you eat, that's crazy to me, very cool stuff. So I got a whole <laughs> series of videos coming out about that. And the bottom line though, spoiler alert, front load your calories in the day, earlier the better, but, you know, a kid, the, the goal, whole yeah. breakfast, eat like a king, lunch like a prince, blah, 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 yeah. So big breakfast, front load, smaller dinners earlier in the day. It's a very sounds like a very blue zone thing to do. Maybe I'm wrong about that as well, but oh no, no actually, I'm wrong? well certainly Loma Linda and the Adventists actually have uh, a, a a tradition of of eating two meals a day, yeah. or in the very least making breakfast and lunch the biggest meal of the day. And that may actually be playing a role mm -hmm. in the fact that they're the longest formally studied population in the world. It's not just um, that they're vegetarian and eat nuts and don't smoke and exercise, mm -hmm. but also perhaps because they are eating to, uh, they're eating with the rhythm. Yeah. <laughs> well, there's your uh, teaser for the new book. I'm super excited about that. I gotta go. Okay, all right. Thank you so much, Dr. Gregor, for coming on. Finally saw the uh, mic on Mike. Can I get Michael versus Michael or plus Michael, whatever you want to say. It's finally happened. So thank you so much for watching. Thank you so much for talking. Keep it up. I appreciate it. And I'll see you sometime in the future, hopefully. Indeed, keep up the good work yourself. All right, thank you. All right, have a good day. Bye. All right.